welcome to our church online we're so happy that you could join us today even as it's palm sunday um it's such a poignant thing to remember uh, jesus the humble servant of god the son of god um who lived such a humble simple life on earth did such great things but on this day he rode into jerusalem on a colt and the people worshiped him and they they waved palm branches they laid down their coats welcoming him into the city of course within a week the very same people turned their faces away rejected him and crucified him but this day for us is one to remember who this god really is he is the king of glory can we read psalm 24 together i'm reading it from the passion translation let's just look closer at who this king is and how we can approach him the king of glory psalm 24 creation's king yahweh claims the world as his everything and everyone belong to him He is the one who pushed back oceans to let the dry ground appear planting firm foundations for the earth Who comes before the king Who then is allowed to ascend the mountain of Yahweh and who has the privilege of entering into God's holy place Those who are clean whose works and ways are pure whose hearts are true and sealed by the truth those who never deceive whose words are sure they will receive yahweh's blessing and righteousness given by the savior god they will stand before god for they seek the pleasure of god's face the god of jacob the king is coming so wake up you living gateways lift up your heads you doorways of eternity welcome the king of glory for he is about to come through you you ask who is this king of glory yahweh armed and ready for battle yahweh invincible in every way so wake up you living gateways and rejoice fling wide you eternal doors here he comes the king of glory is ready to come in you ask who is this king of glory he is yahweh armed and ready for battle the mighty one the invincible commander of heaven's hosts yes he is the king of glory even as we get into a time of worship can we pause in his presence can we see jesus for who he really is the mighty one the invincible one the king of glory let's worship together it was such a day like this uh, jesus enters into jerusalem and uh, everyone in the crowd sang hosanna hosanna to the son of david hosanna hosanna and this incident is very important because this is one of the incident that's been recorded in all four gospels and uh, as we celebrate this day and as we remember what how god entered into jerusalem i, I just want to ask each and every one of us as we enter into this time of worship can we let him in the place wherever we are i'll read from Matthew chapter 21 The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted Hosanna to the son of David Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest heaven Hosanna Hosanna They lifted his name high above every other name Whatever is going through in our mind right now can we lift his name high above every other name let's praise our eyes wherever we are In your presence 
Cause all our fears are washed away Washed away Hosanna Hosanna You are the God who saves us Worthy of all our praises Hear the sound to you in your kingdom broken lives are made new you make us new cause when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. sing Hosanna Hosanna we'll sing it one more time and as it says you're the he's the one who saves us and his name is to be praised Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saves us worthy of all to be praised Jesus can we pause for a minute and just think Lord I'm here to worship your father Lord may I pray Lord Father Lord in everything that we do Lord Jesus Lord we want to lift your name and for that we want you to be in the center of everything that we do Lord Jesus We might not have the words to articulate it. We might, times we might not even have that right tune to sing. But how beautiful it is. He's a God who sees our heart. It's all 
Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. His name, Jesus, is not an idea or it's not a theory, but in His name there is deliverance. In His name, dead, dry bones come alive. There is power in His name, and we don't call it just because it's been taught to us. Just because it is a, it, it 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 is some kind of an idea in our mind. No, we don't do that. There's power in His name. The salvation through His name, through Him. He's an everlasting Father. Jesus. Jesus. If there are areas in our life which needs to come alive, we've been doing this series for quite some week now. And if there's areas in our life which has to come alive, and as we sing this song, if you can make this your prayer and ask Him, Lord, 
come alive come alive every dry bones come alive in the name of jesus every laziness every uh, every things that's stopping us to operate in in the fullness of his presence can we submit to him because this is place where miracles happen in his name miracles happen jesus this is a house of worship this is a place of praise where every demon trembles where we proclaim your This is a house of healing Our hearts are full of faith You have a full attention You have the final say Jesus come alive in the name of Jesus this is a house of miracles we bring everything to the feet of Jesus everything in the name of Jesus this is a house of miracles resurrection power your blood runs through our way your kingdom triumphs over even the cold is great come alive in the name
come alive in the name of Jesus come alive in the name of Jesus this is a house of miracles we bring everything to the feet of Jesus everything Wherever you are is the house of miracle. It's a place where miracles happen. In His presence, miracles happen. In His presence, dry bones come alive. If you're looking out for wisdom, ask Him, Lord, let it come alive, Lord Father. Jesus. Father, we just thank you and praise you. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for his presence with us even now. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for how you are moving in our lives, how you are moving in our world. Thank you, Lord, for the things you are doing. Father, the things that are happening all across the globe. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your intervention. We thank you for your church. We thank you for your people. We thank you, God, for you are going to do greater things in the days to come. Father, we pray right now for war-torn nations that, Lord, you would be their restoration. You would, Lord, bring heaven to earth in those spaces. Father, I pray very specially for the women and the children who have been made destitute by war, by calamity, by, by a pandemic, by, by a natural calamities. Father, we just pray the elderly, the, the destitute, the newborns, I just pray that, Lord, you will meet them at the point of their need. Father, we pray that, Lord, our prayers would reach you. I pray that, Lord, the prayers that are being prayed from these areas in the world, war torn, struggling areas, will reach you, that you will move on their behalf, O oh Father. Lord, I pray also very specially for the nations of the world, for governments, that they will have wisdom, that leaders will have wisdom. Leaders will lead with compassion, and, and Lord, they will have skill in how they lead their nations, O oh Father. We pray for the financial state of the whole world. We pray against recession. We pray against an economic downturn. We pray, O oh God, that you will protect your people. Protect, Lord, the people who are most unaware of things. That, Lord, you will continue to guide us and lead us, O oh Father, and go before us. Lord, I pray right now for those who are in this service. Lord, those who have come in with a heavy heart. I pray, O oh Father, that, Lord, you will lighten the burden. That you would meet them, O oh Father, right where they're at. I pray, Lord, for anyone who is struggling, Lord, emotionally or physically, Lord, anyone who's struggling in a very important relationship, that you would set them free, you would give them deliverance, O oh Father. Lord, I pray for those who are asking you for a breakthrough in their finances. We pray that, Lord Jehovah Jireh, you would help and provide. I pray, O oh Father, if anyone is giving up on life, if anyone is saying, I can't do this anymore, I cannot go on, I pray that, Lord, you will give them a fresh release of hope. I pray they will wait in expectation for you, Father. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will show us that you truly are the king of our lives. I pray that, God, we will hand over the reins of our life to you. I pray that, God, we will live in a surrender on a daily basis. I pray that, Lord, you would allow, we would allow you to move in our lives. Holy Spirit, we give you access. Help us, lead us, guide, guide us and go before us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The last song we sang during our worship. We're going to do that bridge one more time. We're going to proclaim and we're going to believe that He is moving. We're going to speak that into every dry bones. We're going to speak that in faith. Wherever we are, we're going to speak that into situations that doesn't seem moving anywhere. We're going to speak that to come alive in Jesus' name. To come alive in Jesus' name. I still believe you're moving. I still believe you're speaking. God, I believe you're working. All things for good I fix my eyes on heaven God, I receive your wishing God, I believe you're working All things for good We do it 
one more time. I still believe you moving. I still believe you speaking. God, I believe you working. All things for good. I fix my eyes on heaven. God, I receive your wish. God, I believe you working. All things for good. Come alive. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come alive. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything name of Jesus this is a house of miracles sing as you believe it come alive in the name of Jesus come alive in the name of Jesus this is a house of miracles we bring everything to the feet of Jesus everything the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. God, we believe, Lord Father, that you're moving, you're working. All things, not just one thing, two things, three things, but all things, Lord Father, for our good. We believe in you, in you Lord Jesus. We humble ourselves in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you know, we've been doing the Come Alive series, which has been for the season of Lent. We are coming to the end of that. And even as just before we get into the Word of God, a few announcements. Uh, we have VBS, which is happening at church. It's going to be in person. Um, if you have children between the ages of 5 to 16, um, you're welcome to register them for this. It's happening in Chennai at our um, campus church. So get in touch with us, uh, DM us or the numbers are on the screen, text us. We'd love to be in touch with you. It's happening from May 1st to May 5th. And we'd love to meet your children. It's going to be an exciting time. We also have a Bible plan that's up and running. It's called Face to Face with Jesus. It's on the YouVersion Bible app. Would love for you to do it um, individually or with friends. Uh, we promise you it's going to be a blessing. Even as we get into the God's word, I just pray that you will quieten yourself because today's word um, is a powerful one and a much needed one. So can we tune our hearts and ears to hear what God has to say to us? Hi Church, it's such a joy and a privilege to be bringing God's Word to you today. Uh, even as we've been going through this uh, entire Lenten series, um, you know, we've been doing this series called Come Alive in Jesus. And for most of you, I think you have also been following our face-to-face -face with Jesus Bible plan. I hope it's been a blessing even today as we all celebrate Palm Sunday. And even as we ha have this coming entire week as a lead up to Easter, I believe God wants to do something in and through us. God wants to minister to us. God wants to shift our focus. 
And above all, I believe he wants to, you know, um, waken all those dead areas in our lives, which we've been, you know, quietly just, you know, keeping quiet and uh, not allowing God to move there. I think he wants us to see a quickening in our spirit so that we can experience his life giving power in our lives. And even as we are continuing on, it's Palm Sunday. And today, what we are going to be looking at is come alive in worship. Uh, it's a big topic. Worship is a big topic. And for a lot of us, worship is probably, you know what, those two songs that we sing before hearing God's word. Or, you know, it's it's that thing they set the entire service up before we hear God's word. And, you know, many a times, so many things have a different percentage of weightage that's been given over the years. For some, we believe only the word of God is important. And so we can skip worship. For some of us, we believe worship only is important. We don't have to pay attention to the word of God. But I believe as we dwell in God's word, you'll see that everything is intertwined. There's a lead up to which God asks us to get into a time of worship so that we'll be able to see him. We'll be able to, you know, move our attention towards him. And then when we're hearing his word, he's able to put that in good soil. That word comes alive in us. And so today, as we look through um, this entire topic of come alive in worship, one of the things which I want us to emphasize is the fact that we are here to worship. We are created to worship. We've been redeemed to worship. We've been, um, you know, uh, set apart to worship. And you might be like, why does a God want his children to be worshiping him? Because he's worthy of our worship. You know, it's not like he forces it on us, but he takes delight when we worship him. And even as we look through the scriptures, even as we read through some of the uh truths that we oftentimes fail to understand when it comes to worship, I would ask if your hearts would be open and that you'll be able to allow him to, you know, work in and through your lives. You know, even as I talk about this topic, it's not there's only a select few songs that, you know, are meant for worship. No, I believe worship comes from an inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's basically his words that have been put to tune so that it resonates in our spirit, so that it becomes warfare. So that it becomes something that we'll be able to hold on to in times of trial and tribulation. Today, even as we celebrate Palm Sunday, my reference passage is from Hebrews though. But I just wanted to first start off from Luke chapter 19. Where Luke gives this beautiful illustration of um, Jesus heading towards Jerusalem. And it's in that journey, he uh, asks his disciples, a few of them, to go ahead, find that colt. And so that he can use it to enter into Jerusalem. And there's this buzz that's been happening all this while. Because he's just finished meeting. Uh, in Luke, if you read especially, you read that he's finished meeting Zacchaeus. He's finished doing a whole bunch of healing. And he's walking. And as he's walking, there's, um, there's influence just spreading along the road. People are just gathering around. People are seeing, okay, what is he going to do next? Or some people who've been healed are like, you know what, they're in awe of who he is. Or there are those skeptics who are like, you know what, I don't know what uh, he's done, but it just sounds fake. But yet I want to see it for my own eyes to see him fail or see him succeed. But his disciples, as they go forward and get that cold, and as Jesus makes way into Jerusalem, Jesus enters Jerusalem as a king. And the beautiful thing uh, we've seen many a times, uh, we can, you know, there's so many elements of this that we can take. You know, for some of us, you know, we might suddenly look at that, that, that donkey that was willing. Why did he choose that one donkey that was there? Or, you know, the way uh, the people welcomed him. Jesus, when he entered, entered in as a humble, meek king into Jerusalem. He didn't go in as this warrior king. And to a watching world, they wanted a warrior king. They wanted someone who would lead them into victory. If you look from the eyes of the people, they wanted temporary freedom. They wanted an uprising. They wanted something to go against the Romans so that they'd be set free. But it was a temporary freedom and not a permanent freedom. And it got me thinking many a times we approach Jesus for temporary solutions. We approach Jesus for temporary solutions. How many times have we moved, you know, to his throne room for a permanent solution. And I believe if we are seeking God for a permanent solution, we will understand his will. We will understand his timing. We would understand his purpose. So even as we see the people's expectations was for temporary freedom, 
And even as we today have to pursue for a more permanent freedom, I want us to keep that at the back of our mind even as we read today's scripture from Hebrews chapter 13. And this is what it says. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Even as I read from Hebrews chapter 13, this king that walked into Jerusalem, that came into Jerusalem and, you know, was the redemption for all of us, he died. And he didn't just die an ordinary death. He took the shame, the guilt, the burden of sin once and for all. And like every other animal that the high priest had to sacrifice at the temple, he was cast out. And once and for all, we have been redeemed. And today with that assurance, with that, uh, with that confidence, can we go in and worship him? And our worship will automatically change. We'll suddenly feel that we are not being governed by things that are around us. We'll suddenly realize, you know what, the ambience, the style of music, the sound, the light, the people that are around, the way the song is sung, the way the band has been put together, all that doesn't matter. Because it will be personally between you and your God. It will be personally between you and Jesus because you understand that he is the one who's worthy of our praise. No one else. We won't go by the motions of it. You know, they wouldn't have to build it up to a place for us to worship, but we will just go in and we are in there in hundred. We are ready to worship. We are ready to connect with God. The pressures of this world, the situations of this world, the, the turmoil that we've been struggling with all comes to a standstill there when we worship him. And who is it that we are worshipping today? And I want to emphasize that a bit more. As I mentioned earlier, we are worshipping a king, not an earthly king. He is the king of kings and the lord of lords. The Israelites way back when Samuel was a prophet went to him and said, you know what, give us a king. Why did they want a king? Because they saw around and everyone around their neighboring countries had a king. And they felt that if they had to have a sense of identity of who they are as a nation, they need to have a king. And so they went to Samuel. And I really believe it displeased God, it displeased Samuel. But as they went and asked, God put this forward and said, let them know that this is what a king will do. And if you read that in 1 Samuel chapter 18, you'll see a couple of things. And I just want to highlight what all he's going to do. It says, he will reign over you and will claim his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses and they will run in front of his chariots. He'll assign some as commanders of thousands and fifties and others he'll make them plow the ground and reap his harvest. Others to make weapons of war and equipment for chariots. He will take your daughters to perfumers and cooks and bakers. He'll, make, he'll take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys will be taken for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flock and for yourselves will become his slaves. And it goes on to say, God says, on that day when you cry out for relief from a king, the Lord will not answer you. After God had spoken all this, they still were adamant that they wanted a king. And so when Samuel had to anoint Saul, and I believe everything falls under his perfect will because he knows the heart of man. He knows this is what they're going to desire. And so he told them, hey, I know this is what you desire, but this is what he's going to do. And you read the entire Israel, you know, and then Judah, the entire history of kings that came, none of them were able to actually be a good king. None of them were able to actually, you know, be right 
with God all through their life. They all had pitfalls. They all struggled because they were all humans. And so here Jesus is walking in as a king, not as a human king would walk in. Not as how a human king would, you know, uh, gather an army around. No, he walked in with people who he had touched, with people who had witnessed him, with some people who didn't believe in him also. And some who are out there just to make sure that he doesn't succeed and, you know, to pull him down. Jesus walked with those people in, but he walked as a humble and as a meek king so that he can be led to the altar. He can be sacrificed as a perfect lamb. He is the perfect king. He is the perfect lamb. And so today when we worship this king, I want you to understand that he's not a king who has to do anything to prove himself. No, he is king over all of us. He created the world. And so today, when we come alive in worship, you're coming alive to the worship of this king who is magnificent. In, in fact, even I don't have words to say of what he is because each of us will have an attribute of God that will stick out. Each of us, every time when you go to the throne room of worship, will be able to see what a glimpse of who he is and what he's done for some of us the very nature speaks of what he's done when you see the stars when you see the sky when you see the plants when you see a sunrise when you see a sunset when you see the clouds you see a king who took time to create everything this is not a king of uh, egypt where you know he had a sorcerer for this he had a, a doctor to do uh, to you know, mix some concoctions of uh, herbs and create medicine. No, he is the king who when he speaks, healing happens. He is a king when he speaks, the earth shakes, the earth trembles, the heavens move. Here is a king who can bring everything to a standstill, yet so humble. And so many a times when we come alive in worship, there are a couple of elements where we fail to understand. We are so caught up many a times in the periphery of worship. We are caught up sometimes, a lot of times, with our own personal problems that we fail to understand that I'm worshipping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm worshipping a king even to be in his courtroom is a big deal. And I understand the power and the and the cost of redemption that he has paid for us. So today with this in mind, he is a king who is once and for all set in eternity as king. There's no change. And so that's why when he came down and when he did everything, it was countercultural to what a king would do, to what redemption would look like, to what the people wanted. But today as his children, can we look to him? Because his status of king or his the position of being king will never change. He will always be king. He is the Alpha and the Omega. But our understanding of him will change as we understand, as we go close to him, as we go near him, as we ask him, as we dig deeper into his wells. God, I want to know you more. So today, if you've been struggling to see him for who he is, probably you've amassed a whole bunch of your own issues and thought this needs, you know, I need a redeemer, I need a deliverer, I need a healer. And all those areas of who we describe as God, he's all put together. He's all put together. And many of the times, there are so many things that we've not added. He's all of that put together still. Would you still go to him? and worship him for who he is. I would ask that you would always look to him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is the righteous judge. He is the one who's willing to work with us wherever we are at. He's willing to listen to us. He's willing to forgive, pardon. When we read the parables of the king who actually you know, dismissed two of his people who had huge sums of money, he's willing to forgive us entirely but are we willing to go to the king are we willing to go to the king are we willing to sit at his throne and listen to what he's commanding us to do even as we um, continue in this i have two things with regard to come alive in worship which i want to leave so that we'll be able to worship him in all honesty the first thing is when we come alive in worship it must disrupt us 
when we come alive in worship it must disrupt us it should stop us from what we're doing currently in the present and move us to looking at him and our entire focus should be at him luke chapter 19 verses 37 to 46 and this is what it says when he came near the place where the road goes down the mount of olives the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise god in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen blessed is the king who comes in the name of the lord peace in heaven and glory in the highest some of the pharisees in the crowd said to jesus teacher rebuke your disciples i tell you he replied if they keep quiet the stones will cry out and he approached jerusalem and saw the city he wept over it and said if you even know had only known on this day what would bring you peace but now it is hidden from your eyes the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side they will dash you to the ground you and the children within your walls they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of god's coming to you when jesus entered the temple courts he began to drive out those who were selling it is written he said to them my house will be a house of prayer but you have made it into a den of robbers even as we read couple of things that we can see when jesus walks in people who are there are saying why are people worshiping you why are they in fact luke doesn't emphasize that but when you read in john you can see the disciples are actually taking palm leaves and laying it down most of the people are taking their cloaks and they're laying it down they are welcoming a king some of them were acting in worship in welcoming the king some of them were like just standing in the side and they were questioning what is this that's happening can you tell your disciples to pipe down we don't want the attention we don't want the romans to think anything and jesus says this if they keep quiet the stones will cry out and i believe many a times we think you know what we are the sole person who's actually there to worship god no god has a multitude of people who are worshiping him you read in revelation the angels are worshiping him i believe his creation is worshiping him today everything that he's created there's nothing that's he's created that moves out of his order and so today when we look at this why is it that we who have free will are struggling to worship him because we are limited we are limited we are allowing the pressure of this world to disrupt us but we are not allowing our worship to disrupt us and even as i was thinking about this i was reminded about reading an article on the earthquake um of how the earthquake occurs and it was god reminding me I want you to be wrecked every time you come in to worship me. It's more than the words, more than the music. Would you give room for me to speak so can I can wreck you so that I can download on you so that the weight of my glory will fall on you. And honestly when when you when you hear the weight of his glory fall on you, you can't hold it but rather just you know literally fall face down. because it's in that disruption we'll be able to see his glory it's in that disruption we'll be able to see his will and plan and purpose it's in that disruption we'll find faith it's in that disruption we'll find trust it's in that disruption we'll know we have favor with him so what does this disruption look like even as i told you i read about this earthquake an earthquake happens as a focus point plates shift underneath and there's this epicenter at which the earthquake occurred and i believe many of us are happy with the shock waves that happen in an earthquake you know like the shock wave that we have body shock waves that happen we have the surface waves that happen body waves are ones where the effect of the earthquake travels and it happens on the main surface of the earth whereas the surface waves are limited to the surface of the earth and so of the planet and so Uh, many times you'll see that the surface waves don't actually have that bigger impact whereas the body waves have a bigger impact and they they tend to you know the epicenter is where the most damage happens but they tend to have smaller damages that keep happening and as it passes away we many a times are okay with some kind of wave and experience that we feel you know what I don't have to draw closer to and if I'm listening to worship song it's okay no listening in is one thing but participating in worship is another thing I would ask if you can participate in worship if you can take a step in 
and say, God, come in, speak to me. Worship many a times is just keeping quiet and allowing God to speak. Worship is allowing God to download his truth into your spirit. Worship is when I'm lifted, the posture is when I lift my hands up, the posture is when I open my heart, the posture of me being in worship is to receive from him, not to tell him, but to receive from him. I exalt him, I tell him who he is, but I receive from him his revelation. And that has to disrupt me. Because many a times are the, we, we want faith to be attested. It's attested in what we speak. We talk about God, you can do all things. You can save me from this. You have saved me from this. Yes, it's good. But are we allowing his words to disrupt us? Our words are exaltation, but I believe his words are there to disrupt us. It will disrupt. He will drop in your spirit something, that shift that will happen in your spirit as you worship. And when you worship him in spirit and in truth, thus God wants us to move. So what will happen is when he disrupts us, there won't anything fake will break entirely. Anything that is true will draw deeper. In worship, when we allow him to disrupt us, we soon understand his nature. We soon understand, here's a God who I'm worshipping, whose nature is entirely different than what I've understood or what I've read or even what I'm singing of. Because let's face it, what's written here is the word of God, is the truth, but it's a part because it was written by a person who was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The song that I'm singing again is the truth of who God is, but also was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And here God is wanting to disrupt me, so I will have a personal revelation about the nature of God. I will have a personal understanding of who he is, of what he governs and how he governs over everything. Yet, in that midst, he also knows the tiniest details. That's what worship is so crucial because it ministers to each and every one differently. It will disrupt each and every one of us differently. For a person who's thinking, this God is so big and I'm so insignificant, the worship will come to a place where he'll say, you know what, I even have numbered your hairs. So what is it that we have lacked today in understanding of God that we fail to understand is because many a times we are just okay with, oh God, I've raised, it's 20 minutes, I'm done with worship, now let's go to the next thing. No, I believe church, we're coming to a season where we have to go deeper, where we have to go deeper into his truth. It all starts with us more, as we come into a corporate worship, there's order because when we all come together, there has to be a certain order. So we have times of worship. But I believe what I'm speaking today is more for personal life. Would we allow his spirit to wreck us and disrupt us? Wreck us so that everything that we've grown up knowing is just part. But there's a whole big world of God that we do not know. Everything that I know about God is just this much. There's a huge part of him that I don't understand. And I have a life, that a lifelong that I have to understand him. And so am I willing to be disrupted every time, every stage to understand and know him more? So today, let us not be people who are complacent, who are okay with either one of those waves that I talked about. But may we all intentionally move to that epicenter where our focus is solely on him. Our focus is not on the periphery, as I mentioned in the beginning, not on the lights, not on the way the song is displayed, or not on the way the musician is playing, no. That I would go in deeper. I would go in deeper. So when Jesus entered, what was Jesus actually um, disrupting in the house of God? He was disrupting things that we had placed as priority. Money lenders thought, you know what, this has become a good strategy. Let's kick all the Gentiles out of the outer courts and let's make this a transactional area. And so if money lenders come, there, there have to be food stalls. There have to be some place to drink. There has to be certain ways in which they have access to different varieties of birds and animals for sacrifice. It became entirely transactional. But when we allow Jesus to wreck our worship, it's never transactional. We enjoy, we long and we desire to be in there. 
And when we desire to be in there, we will rise above our excuses. We will rise above our laziness. We will rise above that apathy that we have. And we'll be like, God, talk to me. You know, many a times we see people who have a song on their lips. That's because I believe there's some part that they have been disrupted by the worship of God. They were worshipping and they were disrupted. And so they have a song in their mouth to sing. They have something about his nature that's touched them. That they are willing to sing about it all day. So today, when we come alive in worship, I want all of us to worship him that way. Where we are worshipping from a place of being disrupted. But God will disrupt and he'll move those areas out. Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 to 14 talks about Jesus, the son of man. And he you know, saw Jesus in this vision. And I believe we need to look at him every time we go into the throne room to worship him. This is how we need to look at him. This is what it says. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Jesus is the king of a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Jesus is the king whose dominion is across everywhere. So if we need to see a dominion break in our life, in our family life, in our street, in our uh, town, in our city, we need to go to the king of all dominions who handles it. And we need to ask him. And that happens constantly. So that's why we say worship is also warfare. Because there is disruption that happens. There is a battle that happens. And we aren't fighting. He is fighting for us. When we raise our anthem, he is fighting on our behalf. So today, can we allow Jesus to step into that area and Press on so that we'll be able to see him be king over our lives. Sinclair B. Ferguson says this. He says, it is God who gives us a spirit of worship. And it is what we know of God that produces the spirit of worship. We might say that worship is simply theology, doctrine, what we think about God going into top gear. Instead of merely thinking about him, we tell him in prayer and praise and song how great and glorious we believe him to be. Many a times we are looking for the right phrases to exalt him. But if we can go to a place of being in truth and honesty to him and saying, God, this is who you are to me. To me, this is who you are. And let's be people who speak for ourselves. Who is he to you? Because that's where God will show us who he really is. He will disrupt all that. He will disrupt and show us more, even more of who he really is. And I believe when we step into that area, he wants us to be changed. He doesn't want us to leave the same way that we came in when we actually entered into his throne room. We will leave that changed of knowing who Jesus is. The second part that I wanted to emphasize specifically when we come alive in worship, as I said, first, it must disrupt us. The second, it costs us. As Jesus was king and as he entered into Jerusalem, he was literally going to lay down his life. It cost him his entire life. It cost God, his son in this world. It cost God, his son. He, we read in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's the only person that he had that he gave wholeheartedly to redeem all of us. So today when we come into a throne room of worship, it should cost us. Today, what is worship? Worship is just, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not the 20 minutes, but it's rather our entire life. Our work is worship. Our, um, our eating and drinking is worship, our doing life, our parenting, our marriage, our singleness, our work, everything is worship. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 to 2 in the message says this. So it says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you 
take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-informed maturity in you. And I've highlighted the word offering and place it before God as an offering. Verse 15, which we read in Hebrews 13, 15, it said, sacrifice of praise. I believe worship has to cost us. Just because Jesus died once and for all, the sacrifice has been paid. But it doesn't mean the cost is still covered. It has to cost us. What do you mean? What do I mean by that is the fact that uh, when Israel, before Jesus died, had to sacrifice an animal every time they went into the temple, be it for whatever sin, and they offered based on what they were capable of. And so that became very transactional. And so in that, people didn't even have... Uh, uh, as much as they offered guilt offerings and all that thanks offerings and all, somewhere the heaviness of sin was not seen. They went, they offered, and they the innocence, uh, the innocent of the lamb bore whatever sin they had carried, and then they are done, and then they were sacrificed and they were redeemed. But Jesus, when he died on the cross, I believe most of the time, the problem with us is we don't understand the cost. And we'll never understand the cost because the equation that God works out is very different. But when we look at the cost which God expects us to worship, it has to cost us. So we are happy when it's just that 20 minutes of worship, we think. And I have no problem with that. It is important. But I want to take it a step further because I remember when I was talking to a person, he said, you know what, Geshom, it's okay. I'm, I'm coming to church that, that two hours I'll be there. I'll be able to live my life the right way. But honestly, God does not want us to live it right within the four walls of a church. He wants us to live it right 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And this everyday ordinary life will cost us. It will cost us. And today, what is it that's going to cost us? The more you read from Hebrews chapter 13, we read from verses uh, 11 onwards earlier. But I want to read from Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9. And I'm not going to read it. I would rather have you look through the scriptures. But I wanted to highlight a key passages which cause the sacrifice of praise, which cause us to actually worship him. The first thing is to keep worshiping him and to come alive in worship, we need to keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. There's a cost. We need to keep on loving. It doesn't say love. Keep on loving. Keep on. So even if they are being mean, keep on loving. Even if they are saying something which you don't agree with, keep on loving. The second, it says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some of you have done this and entertained angels without realizing it. God's calling us to be open to meeting with people who we do not even know. Because we don't even know what the way in which God can navigate certain ways in which how we entertain, what we care about, what we help in what way. So our worship extends into that. It has to cost us here. It's costing us our time. Because why would we entertain or hospit uh, be hospitable to a stranger? We are hospitable to the people we love, care and probably want to be part of. But we are never hospitable to people who are strangers. But God's causing you, if you can be in tune with my spirit, you'll be hospitable to even strangers. So may we also be open to who God is actually bringing into our lives out of the blue. That we'll be able to be hospitable and we'll be able to see God come through through that. It goes on to say, the third one says in uh, verse 3, it says, Remember those in prison. I Many a times we don't think of prison ministry as a big thing, but I believe it's that's where people are already living with that much guilt, with that much fear, that they are open to knowing that there is salvation and freedom in Jesus. And there's hope after death. 
just uh, a day back i was reading uh, nikki gumbel's devotional and in that he goes on to say one of his own person who actually heads this entire prison ministry paul cowley that he was a thief he was a prisoner he had landed up in jail he came out he accepted jesus christ and he went back and he started doing an amazing prison ministry and for the last so many years has had great impact where many people have given their life to christ which means that they have hope it costs us to worship him it costs us so what is it costing you not all we don't have to tick you know everything here but it will cost us something and we can do one of these the fourth thing it's give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage god will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery today our worship comes even in our marriage bed where we allow god to come in there where we we, we don't give into our selfish desires many a times there are areas where we that's what i say when we say we worship costs us worship does cost us on a sunday it costs us two hours but what god's asking us hey can i step into that area where i'm there with you every day every minute every hour so can we move ahead and see would we actually honor our marriages and our marriage bed for those of us who uh, are single can we strive towards that and say you know what i want to i want to honor that even now even though i'm not commit to marriage right now i want to keep that as one priority as my act of worship for you it goes on to say the next don't love money be satisfied with what you have and the next two verses are so nice because it talks about contentment and this has been ministering to me a lot saying god my contentment levels are so varied Lord how do i have a contentment when it comes to what you've given me how do i have contentment in the place that the time that you place me in how do i have contentment with the eyes that i see because i don't want to have a vision that's way beyond what i actually need for at this point but show me how i can have contentment and so how can we all strive towards this it says you don't love money if we are in communion with jesus we will soon understand that he is our provider it says here for god has said i will never fail you i will never abandon you and so we can say with confidence the lord is my helper so i will have no fear what can mere people do to me and i believe god wants us to come to a place because when it costs us is when a testimony is born when it costs us is when we have a word of encouragement for the people around us remember your leaders who taught the word of god think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith and it goes on to say jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever it goes on to say honor everyone who's around you the leaders who god has placed with you follow their life and their example and so today because everything costs us today to be a parent costs us something to be a spouse costs us something to be a coworker costs us something but can we all put an overarching cover over that in the lies in the lines of worship and say god i want to worship you i want to come alive in worship so i want to experience this of you i want an experience of you in every area so that i'm in tune i want to see your marvelous nature in every area not just in on a sunday but in every area and the last he says in verse 9 do not be attracted by strange new ideas your strength comes from god's grace not from rules about food which don't help those who follow them and i believe the last part is important because today if it costs us to worship our god we will also realize the strange teachings that have been going around the new age ideas the philosophies of this world will not make sense you can't just be something because someone talks about it an influencer talks about it uh, a person who's actually having a following talking about it no it will be all rooted in god's word and as you worship him it will be validated by god himself through his spirit so today as i close this thing comes down to the place that our cost here is so that we can live and serve god well here on this earth we need to run this race well not start it well but finish it well we need to run the course of time well and so today whatever it's looking like in a pursuit of everything 
is it costing us to worship God? Because I believe today, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, a lot of people missed that opportunity to worship him as king because they were busy paying the price for something else. We need to pay the price for worship. And in his time, he will make everything possible. I believe testimonies are going to be birthed because we understood the cost of worship. Verse 14 and 15, as I read earlier, it says, For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. And verse 15, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. We openly profess his name. It's a sacrifice of praise. We understand that it will disrupt us and it costs us because it's preparing us for eternity. The end objective is eternity. As I'm talking about eternity, I was reminded of uh, of a few years back watching Chronicles of Narnia, the third part, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And there's this character called uh, the Repichi, which is like, uh, uh, who's a a rat, I think, yeah. And he uh, is a soldier. He has a sword and he fights. And at the end of the battle, as Aslan is standing there, and as the waves are actually um, there to actually take people, it, it's more or less like, you know, a time where they can step into between different uh, time periods. But as Aslan is standing there, he says to Aslan, I have long desired to see your country. And C.S. Lewis, when he writes, he talks of Aslan as God. And Repichip is telling, I want to go see your country. I want to see eternity. And he's, and Aslan tells him, that place is for all noble people just like you. And so as he steps out, he says, I have served well here. I am excited to go there. And one thing he does is, he just doesn't walk with sadness, but he actually starts sprinting takes a small um, boat, sits on it, and is seen riding that wave, entering into eternity. And as I was preparing, suddenly that clip came into my mind. And I was reminded, am I serving, finishing well here, so I am excited to meet my Savior on the other side? Because if it didn't disrupt me here, if it didn't cost me here, I might be worried about my eternity. But if my worship disrupted me, If it broke me in my inner being, in areas where I have so long probably put up walls, when it's broke, when it breaks those areas, and when it costs me, because I know, God, this is where I find refuge, this is where I find strength, this is where I find life. And if I can hold on to him in every area of my life, not just select few, but every area, as I read from Hebrews 1 to 9, As we step into that area, I believe God will enable us to see eternity in a whole new way, where we'll be excited, we'll be thrilled to spend time with him. So even when we close our eyes here on this earth, it's not one of regret, but it's one of fulfillment. Lord, I've served you here. I'm coming there to be with you. So today, as I conclude, I want us to come into a place of worship, worshiping him. And, you know, um, since it's a themed around worship, you might be thinking probably we'll close with worship. No, I want you all to make a personal commitment. Personal commitment to say that, Jesus, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. I want us to come to a place where I'm going to ask you to say, God, I'm sorry that I've not allowed you to disrupt me. I've rather just told whatever I want and I've walked out. But I'm going to wait here in your presence. I'm going to stay still in your presence. I'm going to allow you to soak me. I'm going to allow you to just fill me up. And as I live to please you in every area, I want to see you more close than ever before. So can we just pray and close? A loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, even as we heard your word, You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. You've come, Lord Jesus, already into this earth. And today you're seated on the throne. You are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Lord, as a church, we pray right now that you would come into our hearts. Thank you that, Lord, we aren't seeing you just for who you are. But I pray that as we come and draw closer to you, 
you will disrupt every area lord jesus where we have confidence where we lack confidence every area that we be disrupted so that we'll see you clearly i pray lord the cost of worshiping you that we'll understand and not just keep it for a sunday for two hour service but we'll move it into every area of our life come be with us lord jesus show us drop into our spirits lord let the weight of your glory fall on us lord so that we'll be able to understand that this god that we worship is magnificent who has so much to offer that we'll be thirsty and we'll be willing to drink of your deep wells lord be with us and bless us i pray that you'll be with each and every one of your children right now strengthen them bless them protection be upon them lord i pray your favor and your grace will be upon each be with us and bless us we ask this all in your most precious name amen amen i just wanted to close today's service by reading hebrews 13 verse 20 to 21 it says now may the god of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our lord jesus that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through jesus christ to whom be glory forever and ever amen amen so even as we step out this week let's step out saying lord i want to come alive in my worship i don't want to go back the same and i pray that you will have stories of where god's met you when you were having coffee in the morning all by yourself or when you were driving to work or when you were in that when you were just waiting on him that he dropped so much and i pray let us all live lives of worship for him it will cost us but we will be able to see him more clear than ever before i pray that even as we move towards this easter week that god's power would strengthen us it will refresh us it will bring us to a place of wanting to draw closer to him it will bring us to a place of wanting to be with him more than ever before i pray for healing health and strength over you god's peace be upon you have a blessed week and god bless you all so church even as we just saw when we come alive uh, in worship it must change us it must leave us changed and as you get into this week can i urge that you would worship god in spirit and in truth as he deserves to be worshiped and that you would allow him to disrupt um the comfortable areas of your life and that he will teach you to offer him a sacrifice of praise as you go into this week may god bless you in all that you do remember this that whoever finds jesus finds life god bless you Amen.